Good afternoon, everyone. I've had a really great time um, this afternoon, and so I just want to thank you all for coming out, because I think in addition to all of the presentations, the conversations that I've been a part of and, and that I've witnessed um, have been equally, if not more, enjoyable in just seeing everybody come together. In late January of this year, I had to travel by, by plane to the annual United States Association of Small Business and Entrepreneurship Conference in Philadelphia. I think as most do, I had the expectation that everything would be fine, but once the aircraft started accelerating down the runway, I had a gut feeling that something was off. I'd later find out that the other passengers had had that same gut feeling. As the plane was barely ascending, it stalled with some jerking movements, and resistance, and then it rather abruptly touched down in sync with the pilot's announcement of flight aborted. After waiting for a couple of hours back at the gate, we'd all find out that there had been a so-called, sorry about that, I'm not, I'm not used to using a Mac. I'm a PC person, so forgive me. Okay. So I don't know about you all, but in my opinion, if it's needed for us to be airborne, it's not so minor. So we got back on the plane, repeated the usual steps, but this time, after a much needed correction, um, we were able to not only become airborne and ascend, but we were also able to be propelled through the skies with much more power than the initial flight. Are there any PC people out here besides me that can appreciate? Yeah. So this is where I may go off script a little bit, but it's okay. So I share this story with you all because I think it's a, a perfect analogy to what I think a lot of professional women, whether you're in tech or whether you're in other professions, experience with respect to um, career and family planning. Before I get into the crux of this presentation, though, I want to note something important or a couple of things that are important, at least to me and, and perhaps to you, too. While this presentation, much like the work my company is currently doing, is focused on professional mothers with biological children, for reasons that will be made clear, I also want you to think of all of the women in the workplace who become mothers not only through biology, but also perhaps because of adoption, fostering, or familial circumstance. And then I also want you to think more broadly of women in the workplace, as well as everyone else, uh, regardless of sex or gender, for the meaningful work we all strive to do in our lives. The literature demonstrates that whether for biological or evolutionary reasons, societal incentives or other motivations, an overwhelming portion of not only Americans but also humans are drawn, drawn toward parenthood. In the States, for example, a 2013 Gallup poll found that 95% of Americans want children, 74% have children, 16% don't have children but want them, 3% don't have children but would have liked to have had them, and 5% don't want children. For many, if not the majority, this gravitational pull can manifest differently for various reasons, but there are overwhelming similarities. Often, the strongest motivators are the visceral and primal desires that many have to bring forth life and have life beyond one's own, thereby engendering a sense of immortality and everlasting legacy. These are all powerful feelings. These are all important aspects of many people's life purpose as self-reported. However, as important as the identification of life purpose on account of biological motivations and imperatives is, for most people, there is another equally profound motivation at force at work that moves us through life and gives us a sense of purpose, direction, perspectiveness, and optimism. It's our intellectual curiosity, and specifically, our curiosity and thirst for knowledge, perhaps in a particular field or pursuit or industry, that if we are fortunate, yield satisfying careers and a sense of self, premised not on what our bodies can do, but what our minds can imagine and the pressing and critical problems that our minds can solve. As humans, we are not only driven by a reproductive imperative, but also very much by a quest to know, to solve, and to create, as can often be accomplished in our careers. My hope is that you have noticed thus far that I have not focused on the often self-reported life purposes of women, but rather of people. For sex and gender aside, there are far more similarities in our individual and collective life purposes than differences. Increasingly and thankfully, we are fortunate to live in a time of great promise. Despite the very real societal issues and heartbreaks that we face, especially as of late, 
A review of the historical record shows us that though there are opportunity and outcome gaps which we must work furiously and creatively to close, we have wondrous tools at our disposal, as well as the individual and collective knowledge to expedite progress in addressing significant societal issues with technology. For the past nearly 60 years in the United States and Western European countries, and for even shorter periods of time outside of the West, women have increasingly pursued and found not only the means to become financially self-sufficient through jobs, but they have also been able to participate in a knowledge economy broadly defined, in which their intellectual talents have been integral to solving problems and pushing the progress needle that much further. A 2016 Alter Conference presentation titled Oh, sorry, AlterConf presentation titled, titled Crossing the Language Divide, Making Programming Accessible to English and Non-English Speakers Alike, eloquently touched on the contributions of women in technology, especially early computer programming. So the contribution of women early on in computer programming was undeniably a benefit to humanity. And yet, as women's presence has increased in the workforce, in tech and in other uh, fields, something disappointing continually happens. This something is not, at least from my perspective, the result of a conspiracy or even broad societal malicious intent, but rather that of society being oblivious to something rather important. That while sexism and other negative isms must be damned and repudiated, there are some biological differences between men and women that if we insist don't exist or reason that they don't have significant impacts on our lives and goals can make us that much less attuned to certain other issues and less equipped to ensure that we close opportunity and outcome gaps such as the gender pay gap. Okay. Little did you know this would be the comedy hour too. Okay. okay. So disequilibrium. By my mid-twenties I was flying. I had graduated from college, taken a couple years off to work, and then I had returned to school to pursue my master's. Within the same year I earned my master's, I got married to my college sweetheart, officially started my career, and then within a year and a half, I'd had my first child. The first part of that short chronology was I, as how I expected it to be, quite linear and forward moving, but the second part and beyond threw me for a loop. Things became unbalanced. There was disequilibrium, and by the time I had my second child, two years after my first, I had an even more profound sense of disequilibrium and despair. In my particular case, I was clinically depressed and struggled with postpartum depression, anxiety, and the intrusion of suicidal thoughts and legitimate fears about my ability to care for myself and by extension my children. I was dealing with an existential threat, me. I felt lost. On the one hand, I was blessed with these precious new lives, and yet on the other, I had felt I had lost a sense of myself, primarily because I felt like my career had stalled and with it an essential part of my identity. One wing of the plane, my personal life, was better positioned than the other wing, my career, with the plane itself representing my sense of self and life purpose. This feeling of lack of balance and uncertainty, as if I were a hamster in a wheel just spinning around, was ever present until my second child was around six months. Compounding the fact that I could tell that despite my husband's and my personal life being on the trajectory we had wanted and for which we had meticulously planned, his career was taking off while mine was stalling. After much introspection, secondary research, and more recently, primary research, including interviews and surveys with diverse professional women, it became clear that I, along with others, had started flying as best as I knew how, but as a first-time mother without the lived experiences or aids to prepare me for the immense and challenging undertaking that is not only creating life and building a family, but also creating and sustaining my career. And to take it a step further, I had not yet li the lived experiences to know that while we are all equal, our realities present unique challenges that must be taken into account for our benefit. In the case of professional women who get pregnant and have one or more children, the physical and mental rigors of creating life can create unexpected challenges when it comes to optimizing decisions related to not only our personal lives and health, but also our careers as we transition from pregnancy to motherhood in the professional context where we so greatly experience various unintended setbacks as professional women, per research, is not just motherhood itself, but the transition to motherhood starting in pregnancy. Is it because we're biologically inferior? Unequivocally, no, and far from it, but I'll return to that in just a moment. For women who struggle with pregnancy-related conditions such as nausea with or without vomiting, commonly known as morning sickness, or to many of us, if I can say, all damn day sickness or daggone, I'm sorry if that 
goes against the code of conduct, <laughs> um, or extreme fatigue, chronic back pain or sciatica, or any number of physical ailments and even neurological hiccups, such as the infamous pregnancy brain, or hormone-induced psychiatric issues, this sense of disequilibrium is often first, first, first noticed during pregnancies, but often with no effective means of addressing these realities in ways that not only preserve the gains made in careers thus far, but also in ways that help professional women augment their natural abilities to continue making optimal choices for career advancement, even when they are running a nine-month physical and mental gauntlet and at times feel like they are running on fumes, as demonstrated right now. While the motherhood penalty is not the major driver, is, um, while the motherhood penalty is not the only driver of the gender pay gap, it is nonetheless a major driver of it. Career advancement ability and trajectory, earning potential and retirement age aggregate benefits are all impacted for professional women to a significant degree by motherhood. Let's look at some especially illustrative graphs on these impacts. As this graph shows, women are increasingly finding opportunity in historically male-dominated occupations, which I think we can all agree is progress. Now, something that this graph does not highlight, but which has been found as a bit of background information, is that on average, college-educated women will have a college-educated woman will have her first child at 30 years old. Consider that the average pregnancy lasts nine months, and the postpartum period, depending on certain metrics, lasts up to 12 months from childbirth, with most women returning to, the, to work within two to three months following birth if they don't leave the workforce. What do you see in this graph that's interesting, that's telling? What I see put in the greater context of childbearing trends among college-educated women uh, college-educated professional women, is that median salary of professional degree recipients by age and gender is for the most part aligned to, uh, to 30 years of age. And then what happens? Between 30 and 32, the gap starts to widen. From 32 to 38, the gap widens even more with the overall story being one of increasingly divergent salaries. Does this graph tell us why this happens? Is correlation causation? No. But again, with other information at our disposal, some educated guesses and even theories supported by evidence can be posited and have been over the last few years. Something is clearly happening during this time. Prevailing research suggests that the realities of motherhood, inclusive of the transition from pregnancy to motherhood, account for a significant part of these disparities. And again, it is not because the transition is insurmountable. Formidable, yes, but insurmountable, no. But more so, as I'd argue, it is because we have yet to shift our thinking to one that considers the family planning realities of professional women in a more integrated fashion. I've put this graph up to show that the gender pay gap, as it's driven by the motherhood penalty, has racial and ethnic dimensions that warrant highlighting. And now a, a look at weekly earnings. This chart does not show the differences within particularly high-paying positions in industries such as finance or law or even medicine, but it does do a great job of showing the differences in earnings among women and men and then also according to parent status. The physical effects of pregnancy and postpartum include, but are not limited to, musculoskeletal pain, fatigue, heartburn, nausea, vomiting, leg cramps, edema of the hands and feet, gum disease, anemia, increases in cardiac output, circulatory system changes, and metabolic changes. The mental effects of pregnancy and postpartum include, but are not limited to, prenatal and postpartum depression, prenatal and postpartum anxiety, prenatal and postpartum psychosis, a rarity but a medical emergency, and alterations in executive function caused by structural and organizational brain changes, such as the fact that the brain literally changes during pregnancy for reasons that have been theorized to have evolutionary purpose. The physical and mental effects of pregnancy in, post, in the postpartum period often impact women's decision-making abilities and capacity. Before I go further, I want to make two things clear. One, I realize that such a comment can be considered controversial, especially if taken as an attack on women's decision-making abilities and capacity, which I hope you all clearly see is not my intent and also especially in light of the recent Google memo controversy. Two, I submit that acknowledging that pregnancy and the postpartum period present women uh, with certain unique physical and mental challenges that can often manifest in additional burdens that test their decision-making abilities is not a normative claim, but an empirical one. 
It is something that must be directly addressed if we are to assist women with augmenting the already, um, the already incredible decision-making abilities and capacity they, they already have so as to mitigate, if not ultimately prevent, pregnancy and postpartum-related decision fatigue that could often lead to suboptimal career-advancing decisions at such a critical life juncture. Pregnancy and postpartum changes include uh, phenomena found to make decision-making more onerous that, than at other points in one's life. The hormone-induced um, physical and mental changes of pregnancy are equally, if not more, demanding than those of puberty, and yet they manifest in a shorter time frame. They also include changes, especially neurological ones, which in the long run have been found to equip mothers with more effective communicative abilities than can be, that can be invaluable in the workplace and have been positively correlated with improved key performance indicators in business, especially in positions and industries that heavily dep depend upon reading people's body language, whether in merger and acquisition negotiations, the courtroom, or in market research interviews. These are all adaptive traits evolved to facilitate a mother's better and more intuitive care for just learning to communicate newborn, but they are also traits equally powerful in the workplace. Due to the fact that as a society, we routinely use a divergent framework for family and career considerations and planning, women and their families, employers, and society experience or are at risk of experiencing the following negative externalities, all of which, if realized, have far-reaching consequences. I'm telling myself to take a water and breathe break right now. So that's what I'm gonna do. Over the last few decades, I'd also argue that regardless of whether we've been aware of it or not, women have been contending with two incredibly powerful forces, millennia of reproductive biology and evolution as manifested in a multitude of pregnancy-related mental and physical changes, as well as invigorated intellectual curiosity and opportunities to pursue intellectual interests and in fulfilling careers. Two equally powerful forces and desires, but we have lacked a way to support women through a framework that is integrative, proactive, and synchronous, putting women in the pilot seats rather than relying on slow-moving public policies and corporate policies to most efficiently and effectively prepare us to truly take flight and soar and have that much, positive, have that much more positive impact in our places of work and economy. As has been mentioned for a number of reasons, some of which are unique to this century, the ability to take in and routinely assess the continual influx of information to make important decisions while also being mentally and physically fatigued often tests women's capacity to constantly optimize decision making and attain optimal outcomes as they experience pregnancy and then new motherhood, not separate from their careers, but along the same continuum. More than any other time, modern professional women are faced with an enormous volume of personal and professional information from which to consider and make family and career decisions on a constant basis. If we believe that to succeed as a society, we, didn't, we need an all hands on deck approach, how can, we assist them if this, how can we assist them with this important and heavy task? For our part, and through AI driven technology, my company is developing a product that augments women's decision making abilities as relevant to integrating family and career, and especially with an awareness of the benefits of having women, particularly mothers, stay in the workplace if that is their desire such as the benefits highlighted from these adaptive traits that typically follow pregnancy, which are long-lasting and often lead to secondary and tertiary benefits, such as increased attention to detail, on-the-job productivity, and efficiency. My company, Architect, works to create digital tools that assist professional women with proactively and integratively planning for family and career advancement to yield success and positive outcomes in both areas. To this end, Architect is Architect is developing a product that appreciates all of the layered experiences and decisions women must make during this crucial time. A product that appreciates that though the term labor is typically reserved for the ultimate process of contracting to catalyze childbirth, the labor process is actually nine months in the making, and the work still continues thereafter, and in fact it increases. A product that is a companion, a counselor, and an optimizer, which augments a woman's innate decision-making abilities and capacity rather than replaces them. That supports and helps facilitate more autonomy and self-sufficiency and not less. That provides equilibrium and relief, not because we are incapable, but because by working smarter, we can work better and make the critical and often time-sensitive decisions concerning our bodies and careers 
that rarely, if ever, are afforded do-overs in a lifetime that only moves forward rather than pauses or allows us to go back. That knows that the turbulence experienced during the pregnancy to motherhood transition is temporary and that resiliency and improved neurological functioning will follow, making pregnant professional women dynamos rather than burdens in the workplace, facilitating gains in business, whether in design labs or boardrooms. A product that assists women with harnessing the power of their own preserved integrated family planning and career data to design and build lives with improved outcomes in both family and career, to become architects of their own lives. As we know now more than ever, the promise of AI technology is not limited to nifty consumer gadgets or improvements in financial and healthcare systems. It extends to the realm of more quickly chipping away at pressing and entrenched societal dilemmas. In this case, we plan to do this in an inclusive manner that considers the needs of not only middle class and wealthy women, but also the needs of women whose incomes put them on the lower end of the, of the socioeconomic strata. Women who are equally important in their humanity and to our economy, and who also have unique op decision optimization issues as a result of also dealing with the daily stressors associated with poverty and related phenomena. Ultimately, we're developing a product that uses technology to provide corrective action that facilitates not only more powerful personal and career propulsion for millions of professional pregnant women and new mothers, but more importantly, and for the long term, technology that facilitates their continued flight. Thank you.